Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. I'm your host, Lisa, and I'm here today with my co-host, Venkat. Um, Venkat, what have we got today? We're exciting day today. We're doing the letter E. Yes, we're doing the letter E and E for electronics. Electronics. So uh, I would say as a hobbyist electronist, I'm um, pretty much a beginner. I've had an electronics lab class as an undergrad, and I've wow. done like a small amount of like primitive soldering, like, um, you know, uh, connector cable soldering kind of stuff. But I, I'm just getting into like trying to do actually something serious. That's like beyond what the school assignment was. Mm. Where are you in electronics? I say I'm a pure hobbyist. I can like follow kits to like put things together. And I know a little bit about how the different, what different things are, but um when it comes down to like how circuits are laid out or building my own circuits or that sort of thing, I have, I would have no idea. Okay. So uh, I, I think uh, that makes you slightly more advanced than me because I think the most complex thing I've done is um, in an electronics lab class, like an assignment was to like, you know, control a stepper motor through a microcontroller, or do a little bit of assembly on it. And yeah. I don't think we even soldered anything that was on a breadboard. So literally just like a couple of jumper cables and uh, a motor went, you know, a couple of steps. That was it. So you've built actual kits. Yeah. What's the most complex kit you've built? I think the favorite thing I ever did was a, um, I have this umbrella that has LEDs in it and it lights up. So as you walk around with your umbrella, it kind of looks like there's LEDs raining on the umbrella. Mm -hmm. Um, It's pretty fancy. You built that from a kit, the umbrella. Yeah, well, it was was at a hacker school, like at a hacker, no, at a hacker space during a class. But it was a kit that the instructors had, but most of it was just sitting there soldering the parts together. Oh, okay. All right. So I think on a scale of one to 10, I'm probably a three, you're probably a five. Sure. uh, That sounds great. We should, um, no. So we have an interview lined up for you guys today with uh, somebody I would, I would judge to be maybe a seven or eight since he's a co-founder in a startup building small electronic equipment kind of things, right? Yeah. So maybe seven or eight. Um, so yeah, somebody who's um, slightly farther along the road than uh, Lisa and me. All right, so let's play the video. All right, so we are here with Ryan Hume, who is an industrial designer based in Seattle. Did I get that right? Yep. All right. And we're going to talk to Ryan about electronics. And uh, the reason I found out Ryan is into electronics and stuff is that he sold me soldering iron. So uh, Ryan, uh, what's your background and how did you get into hobby electronics? Sure. Yeah. Um, My background is not at all in electrical engineering. So I'm kind of a funny representative of electronics (laughs) as a whole, but Um, Yeah, it fits the hobby theme, I suppose. And um, my background is in, I guess, to trace the the electronics hobby all the way back to the beginning, it starts with music. Um, So I have been playing in bands and and have been a musician since I was in middle school. Um, And then in high school, I got a little more serious about it. and started getting into like the recording side of music. So uh, pro audio technology and microphones and computer music. That was uh, about like 2000, 2000, 2001, maybe so I was in, I don't know when I was in middle school then. <laughs> and uh, that was kind of the beginning of like really good home recording on, on computers. Um, my dad had a nice, Mac computer because he's a graphic designer that could that could run recording software and I feel lucky to have been able to uh, kind of experience that at the at the very uh, beginning of when it became affordable for uh, just sort so of what did people do before then like before they recorded directly onto a computer what was this setup then well certainly professional recording studios had uh, you know computer recording since the 90s but um, there weren't a lot of options for just a, someone who wants to dabble at home before, uh, before around the turn of the millennium there. Um, it was just too expensive. The systems cost thousands and thousands of dollars before that. 
um, they had come down to maybe hundreds of dollars at that point. Um, and computers had gotten fast enough with enough storage to hold all the files for building a, a, a song. Um, so, so where are we now? So we're in maybe middle school here. Um, and I was like playing, recording covers of like, classic rock songs with my friends and trying to get like crufty audio interfaces to talk to the computer. And, and then uh, after high school, I went to college at Western Washington University up, in, up north of Seattle in Bellingham and studied industrial design there. Because um, I've always been into making things too, like like building models and and all mm -hmm. sorts of. I was crazy in Legos when I was younger. Um, and then yeah, we collaborated on the design of the house for the exactly. Black Collective project, right? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, totally. you're so multi talented in this design <laughs> stuff. Always been into drawing and yeah, creative. Wanted to get into a creative career, so it got into industrial design. Music kind of set by the wayside then because uh, design school is nuts. And then uh, when I graduated from college, I got a job pretty quickly. Because I had a day job, I couldn't really play in bands so much because that takes a lot of coordination and you have to have a big space. So uh, an electronic music was really uh, kind of gaining in popularity in the United States then. Uh, this was about this would have been 2013 or so, 2012, 2013. Uh, so I got into electronic music, um, particularly because you can make it all by yourself too. So it's, mm -hmm. it's very easy to uh, kind of run it as a hobby in your, in your spare time. And then that one thing led to another, that led to synthesizers and getting really into like the audio synthesis side of, of making music. So is this um, like, when I grew up, the word synthesizer meant the big Yamaha keyboard type things. Is that what you're talking about? Or are you talking about like procedurally generated music of some sort? Well, at this point, probably some more similar to like the big Yamaha keyboard. So I had like a little keyboard with all sorts of knobs and, and sliders that control the sound parameters and, uh, uh, and lots of software synthesizers because, you know, this is much later and computers can run anything at this point. 2013, 2014. So I was uh, building, there's like a, if anyone's watching who's into this stuff, there's synthesizer called Zebra. Um, that's a really neat, like open architecture synth where you can really kind of get down to the, the building blocks of, of synthesis, which in turn, sorry, this is kind of a winding story here, but Zebra is kind of a modular synthesizer. And, uh, and then I got into hardware modular synthesizers, which is like something that uh, universities and rock stars might have had in the 1960s, these giant walls where you patch cables between different units. Mm -hmm. um, the, the circuitry came from uh, like scientific test equipment, so oscillators and uh, voltage generators. So things they used uh, originally for telecommunications um, and uh, testing, testing other electronics. Um, they eventually turned those into instruments. Uh, and now that, that kind of system has been miniaturized in hardware and uh, sort of has, has had a revival in the last 10 or 15 years in a format called Eurorack, which is like a open, uh, open standard where a bunch of tiny companies like the one I run build modules that people buy and plug into a case. Uh, show you here. That looks like this kind of thing. And then you use patch cables to patch modules together and make, kind of make your own instrument. So okay. what do you actually build? Like where does uh, build your own electronics come into this? You have yeah. a synthesizer, you have these modules that small companies sell that you plug in with patch cables. So yeah. where's the electronics DIY part? So I got into the hobby of buying modular synthesizers. Then I started building kits 
of modular synthesizers uh, where you like buy the components and solder them together according to instructions. And then I met my co-founder of the company, Michael, who is a software and electrical engineer, an actual electrical engineer. And uh, we started designing modules together and um, eventually thought, hell, let's try to launch something and see if anyone wants to buy it. Um, that was early 2018 that we launched our first product. Uh, yeah, and ever since then, I've been taking on more and more of the process of, of designing and building electronics. And uh, now we make products like this um, that are a PCB with a panel on front. And all of these jacks are inputs and outputs that people can patch into their, uh, into their own systems and create music. So what does that product do, the one you just showed us? This is a new product called the Maestro that makes voltages that go up and down really fast or really slow in different shapes. And then those voltages control parameters on other modules in the system. Um, so it's, uh, you can make a filter open and close like wow, um, but you can do it like rhythmically or uh, very slowly. Do you have one set up right now that you can play for us? I don't have one set up to demo, unfortunately. <laughs> I know. <Okay>. Next time. <laughs> ah. All right. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, get into it. Can you show us some of your setup and show sure. us some cool stuff? Well, I guess uh, right here, you're looking at my workbench where I build uh, the final product here. So got a Really nice soldering iron here. That's a great thing to have um, when you're when you're starting out in electronics. Is a good soldering iron that gets really uh, gets really hot and transfers a lot of energy into the solder. Bad soldering irons are incredibly frustrating. Um, lots of little parts bins here um, to keep everything organized. Also very important. Uh, this is a microscope up here. Uh, it kind of looks like a little character <laughs> with eyes and uh, yeah it flips down and uh, allows me to look at these um, tiny surface mount components which are like um, all these little guys that get put onto the circuit board by a pick and place machine um, so we get that done off-site obviously and then these arrive these PCBs arrive like this and I stuff all of the um, the parts like little buttons here and uh, jacks and all sorts of things in and then uh, solder the big connections on the back together and test the it. surface mount is when the pins don't poke through the board right exactly That's, uh, surface mount okay and it's yeah. uh, harder to solder there I I've only done like the yeah, they're harder, classic they're... kind yeah they're a lot harder because um, you can't get the needle, I don't know, the pointy part of the soldering iron, like up in the right place exactly. Um, I feel like I haven't actually done a lot of surface mount soldering. I had like some practice kits and a lot of them are like apply, like, use a heat gun to like heat up the stuff or like um, kind of like bake it in an oven sort of thing because uh, yeah, like the heat application I think becomes the tricky part. Yeah, I hate doing surface mount by hand, like, like with a soldering iron. So I use a, um, exactly what you're talking about, what's called a hot air rework station. I have to move my computer over here. It's uh, this guy with this sort of uh, gun looking thing here. That's, uh, it's like a really, really, really hot hair dryer that yeah. uh, <laughs> you hold over the PCB and um, that's how we build our prototypes of our modules. You silk screen solder paste onto the pads with a, a stencil they make for you. And then use tweezers to carefully set each component onto the paste. And it's kind of like the consistency of peanut butter. So it sticks the, mm. sticks the components a bit. And then you carefully move it onto a, a, we actually use a little skillet on the stove to heat up the bottom. And then uh, you hold the, the, the wand over it and it all melts and, and 
straightens everything out. So if you're going to get into to, uh, surface mount, I highly recommend one of those there. <laughs> Save you a lot of, <laughs> a lot of uh, grief. So um, how much does, uh, like all the equipment you have, how much would you estimate it costs your level of um, Well, I have pretty nice versions of some of this stuff because I spend like eight to 10 hours at a time sometimes doing this kind of thing. And it, you know, every little bit speeds, speeds things up. But I mean, you can get a good soldering iron for like a hundred dollars or so. Um, you can find Amazon is amazing for this stuff. It's kind of the only place to buy a lot of this, this electrical engineering bench equipment. And it's all like direct from China. So it's like weird brands and you just look at reviews and buy one that's in your price range. Um, so you can get like, I got this, this microscope on Amazon and the hot air rework station. Cause the, the like U S brands, the legacy brand versions of these things cost a ton of money, um, mm -hmm. hundreds and hundreds of dollars, but you can get, you know, I think this microscope is like a hundred bucks or something. And, the rework stations, probably 200 bucks around there. Okay, so pretty cheap. Uh, it's, yeah, it's doable for sure. If you're gonna, you know, spend some time with it. And for your particular sort of goal or topic area of music, a lot of the hardware has been eaten by software, I guess, right? Like in 1995, you would buy like tens of thousands of dollars of equipment and all that is software now. Yeah, so that's a really interesting uh, kind of place to, to dig in because I actually feel like music technology is in a post software zone now that we haven't seen in a lot of other industries because um, absolutely like you said in the late 90s software ate everything um, for music kind of early compared to a lot of other other mm -hmm. spheres yeah, but um, yeah everybody went digital bought computers all the keyboards got sold for parts, um, you know, and now they're worth, you know, a fortune if you have one of those old analog synths. Um, but uh, yeah, everybody started using software to make music. And then now that everybody uses a computer all day for work, I would say in the last 10 years, there's been a huge hardware revival in um, music technology where people want buttons, people want knobs, People want to like get away from the laptop and just have this like purpose built device that's mm -hmm. kind of almost like a meditative zone mm -hmm. for making music. And because um, you can do all of this stuff on a computer, you, you really don't need any of this. Oh, hardware. okay. So um, this is like um, people who listen to vinyl just because they kind of like, I don't know, it's a thing. It's like it's sounds like good actually... and it's like more tactile okay. um, and you could make a, a fairly strong argument that hardware is like inspires the musician in a different way so it's you like approach making music differently and i i think that's true i, I think it's true for me at least um so you're still continuing to make music here and there yeah <laughs> it's funny how uh, you know i got back into music after college and then i started making music electronics and then the music making went back down again because i'm making electronics but and the computer science kids in my college used to have a t-shirt that said i'd rather write programs to write programs than write programs <laughs> <laughs> i think that's true of a lot of these sort of techie things um so this is a company you have with your uh, buddy right what's the company yeah. called it's called acid rain technology it's just okay. the two of and us and is this like a side hustle or is this both your full-time gigs? It used to be a side hustle and then it has taken over more and more of my time, my life. And now it's, it's pretty much our only thing at this time. Yeah. All right. So thanks for the tour of your workbench. And do you have any sort of uh, uh, closing recommendations for people getting into electronics, any books, any cool pieces of equipment? Yeah, um, i trying to think. There's um, some really cool uh, 
if you've heard of like an Arduino, there mm -hmm. are some audio like focused Arduino like system on a module components that you can start with. Like there's one called Bella and there's one called Daisy as well. And they're, uh, they're really cool. They're designed for real time audio. So they have like special hardware that you don't really have to worry about at first that, that makes them run really fast in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And yeah, you can, uh, and they're really well documented. So again, that's a, a great place to start kind of dipping your toes and maybe downloading someone else's project and opening it on the, on the unit and poking around and seeing if you can change something and not break it. Um, uh, yeah, I think anything to lower the learning curve because embedded electronics is complicated and it's mm -hmm. really, really failure prone. Like, uh, Michael and I joke about like the ghost in the, in the board sometimes. It's like, you just don't know what's going wrong. And you're just searching and searching and searching. And sometimes you just like build a second copy and it works. <laughs> That's, those are the most frustrating moments. So. Yeah, and this is probably my third or fourth attempt to get into electronics. Like there's so many ways to do a false start. Like totally. I make one small project and then I give up. And then five years later, I'm like, I want to build something again. <laughs> totally. Yeah, it can be a little masochistic at times with uh, trying to debug things. But it's really, I think it's really satisfying too. It's, you know, you made an actual little thing that does something. Yeah. yeah. Well, thanks again, Ryan. And you can find Ryan's work at ryanhume.com. Is there any other URL uh, you want to point sure. people to? Acidraintechnology.com is our Acid my little company. Acidraintechnology.com. Okay, so Lisa, what did you think of uh, our conversation with Ryan? Uh, I think you made a great point about how the best jumping off point is when you want to accomplish something. Cause I think I've like tried to come in electronics like a couple different ways and the most successful has definitely been like, I want to build X. Let me figure out how to build X using what I know and like available kits, et cetera. Um, I thought that was good advice. So uh, you? Uh, walk us through an example of that. Like how did you pick something to do? Like that's always the hardest part for me. Like how did you decide I want to do X? for some value of X. So the first thing I built, I wanted a, I wanted a light in my room to go off and on when I tapped a button on my phone. Um, so that was the, the first thing I built is, I made it super complicated because I had no idea what I was doing. I, um, I had like a, my phone had a w app that would talk over my Wi-Fi to a little microchip controller that would translate the instructions to XP commands that would then send it to another little plug that I had under my bed that had a little XP on it that would take the thing and then turn a, a switch, the switch off and on basically, disconnect the power. But I got in my, like, you know, I got all working, super excited, was laying in bed, wanted to turn my light off, went to go turn it off, my phone was dead. Um, so I couldn't like turn, and at that point I realized I could have just built like a little clicker, like just all I needed was like a switch to hit the button <laughs> next to my bed and I would have been just as happy. Yeah, I don't That know. is pretty impressive. Um, like you routed through a phone, uh, IoT controller, all that stuff, like um, yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, you, I was an Android dev at the time, so I made a little Android app that I loaded on my phone, and like yeah. So the simple thing you now think in hindsight you could have done, how would that have worked? Like, what's the simplest solution you thought of for this? Oh, I think the simplest solution is literally just buying a like light switch kit and connecting the string of lights to light switch and plugging the light switch into the plug and the wall under my bed and then turning the switch off and on when I wanted it to. That would have worked just as well. But wait, you want, the point was a remote control type thing, right? Where you wanted to- Yeah, that's what I built. Yeah, so uh, this is like an extension cord solution. I could have, but yeah, I could have really just done an extension cord solution. That's <laughs> correct. Okay. Yeah. And been just as happy. Uh, uh, but uh, I mean, when you add more complexity, part of it is just fun, but partly it does increase your um, sort of flexibility, right? Like I have a couple of those uh, Alexa uh, device things. Uh, do you have a current goal that involves electronics, a current project that would involve some electronics? Not really. The most recent thing I was working on was converting the moon clock from a Raspberry Pi to a proprietary, like a more of a 
just kind of like normal um this is just like a normal dev board for a chip so converting it to like a non raspberry pi because so it doesn't run um linux like so raspberry pi runs linux right so you can write software for linux and it'll run on it these things don't really run operating systems they kind of have like a different bootloading system stuff mm -hmm. So translating the Mooncock code from something that works on an operating system I'm used to, to um, you know writing the driver for the LED and stuff separately was is like I guess the project I would go back to if I had one. But I don't I don't really have a. Oh, but you bought the part, so clearly you have at least a minimum level of commitment because you bought the part that you would use, right? Yeah. So, oh yeah. yeah, I bought several parts. I bought a couple chips because. You know, oh okay. Why not? Uh, so. Uh, Apart from the personal challenge of like writing a driver and bootloader or whatever, what's the sort of advantage to the application to go from an RPI to this thing? One, Raspberry Pis aren't really widely available to do like mass produced chip projects with. So like from a supply chain perspective, you can't use Raspberry Pi. Um, the other thing is that if I, the loading software, so like ideally it would be like a single application that you would load onto the chip, right? Um, and that you do that at the factory. So ideally it would be a lot easier just to load the program and verify that it works versus having the whole operating system thing. Um, I think you can also get smaller, less powerful chips or more application specific chipset um, than whatever the Raspberry Pi is. And that hopefully saves you money because you can buy them cheaper, more in bulk, whatever. Um, I guess the third thing, the reason for it is like form factor. So um, it would be nice to get it kind of a smaller and different shape than the Raspberry Pi because right now I have like the Raspberry Pi and then I have this other thing on top. They call them like a hat. Mm -hmm. So if you're familiar, this is like a Arduino. This is like a normal Arduino. And you see it looks like this. And it's got these little pins here you can put things on. And so this is an Arduino that's got, he's wearing a hat. He's got a hat on him. So there's two mm -hmm. boards. There's the board on top and then the Arduino on the bottom. Uh, this hat runs a motor. That's what this one is. Um, but uh, in the case of the Raspberry Pi, I have a hat that drives the that has chips and like a clock and stuff. So it's used for driving the LED panel. Um, if you make your own chip, you put all that on the same chip. So you do a little bit of chip design. Um, it's got the chip that you need. It's got like the clock. It's got the bright pins just to run the thing. So it's a little you save money basically. Okay. It's more it's more specific to your application. Case. Okay, and I think last time uh, we talked about your clock, you said it was probably under a hundred bucks for all the parts. And I'm guessing most of the cost actually came in the larger physical things and the electronics part of the bill of materials was very cheap, right? Like the RPI was uh, what? Yeah, aren't they like 30 bucks, is it? How much yeah, does so the RPI cost? The bigger ones are, I was using the, I, you can actually use like the Raspberry Pi, like W or whatever, cause I don't need, I don't need Wi-Fi for the mm -hmm. moon clock, weirdly enough. Um, so you can get like, or maybe, anyways, th there's like a small Raspberry Pi. I think it's like 10, five or $10 for the small ones. Um, but then buying the hat thing that Adafruit makes, um, I'd either have to like, I could have like, I guess manufactured that myself, but buying it from Adafruit was like a couple, maybe 15, $20. And then actually the more expensive part was the um, the 32 by 32 LED panel is actually pretty expensive. So. Okay, uh, well, but that you're not going to be able to eliminate, that. right? Because that's almost the physical illumination part. So the cost part that you can eliminate is the more expensive um, Raspberry Pi and the hat. So if you can bring that down through custom design, you can like shave like 10, 15 bucks off the cost yeah. of the and not a bunch of people I talked to actually said that I could probably move to a custom LED kind of thing and like build a chip that had the LEDs in it so that I didn't have to find and source and buy these like these thing these like panels and they're I think I have one here. They're pretty thick. Um so like that helps me get the form factor down. I'd actually like the clock to be a lot thinner than it is. So like there's a lot of little things that go into it that moving to your own stuff is. But that's a big project and like I haven't really made a lot of progress in it yeah. even in the last few years. But that is pretty impressive. Like it's a small application, but um, it's one of those things. Like, did you ever watch that thing about a guy who tried to build a toaster from scratch? No. So this is a, a joke from the Hitchhiker's Guide. So in, in the Hitchhiker's Guide, the character realizes at some point that he lives in an advanced civilization, but doesn't know anything about how anything is made. And he wonders about like, I use a toaster, but I don't know how to make a toaster. So this guy in real life 
decided to actually try. So everything from like smelting copper to make his own like coil wires and stuff. So he got pretty far, like he almost built a, a proper toaster. So yours is not that quite that extreme, but it's going pretty deep. But uh, yeah, uh, so, oh, okay. Uh, for my piece of the show and tell, I can show off what I've sort of bought basically <laughs> since my shopping cart. And as a more advanced expert, you can give me a grade on how good you think my lab is. Okay. Gosh, All right, okay. that's, let me show you what I have. All right, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. That looks like okay. a multimeter. Yes, so that's the first thing I bought. Uh, I feel embarrassed that I've used one like 20 years ago, but this is the first multimeter I've ever owned. So I've <laughs> tested a few battery voltages so far, so <laughs> it, it's not completely unused. Mm -hmm. um, this is the, uh, soldering iron I bought from Ryan, the interview guest. So okay. he sold this to me for 60 bucks, uh, but I think a new one costs like 130 or something. So it's apparently okay. one of the good ones that Warcut reviewed well. Yeah, that's one I have. Oh, you have the same one? Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it looks much fancier than the one I remember using in my university lab in some ways. Or undergrad lab. My grad school lab had a much better one. Okay. And then I bought it seemed like the easiest thing to do would be to just buy a kit with a bunch of assorted parts. So this is the Ellie Goo $55 like ultimate kit. So it has a whole bunch of things. This is the sort of part list. So I recognize half the terms for the things that are in this kit. But to be honest, I'm like not used more than like three or four of these things. Like I've used wires and a stepper motor and uh, a LEDs, I guess. But other than that, I've not like seen any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. All right, the the board the kit has a couple of breadboards. Oh, and I bought an Arduino, sort of a off-brand Eligu Arduino. Mm -hmm. that, this comes with the kit. Sorry, I didn't buy it separately. Oh, and the other thing I bought was a kit for making a digital clock. So it's a small yeah. PCB that looks like that, and seems to have a bunch of like capacitors, a couple of chips, a display. So yeah, this will be the first like PCB soldering. Uh, experiment I've ever done. No, it's fun. All right, so that's Ooh, my, that. that's oh. my startup setup lab. And hopefully in six months, I'll have at least used all the equipment once. <laughs> but it's so it was cheap, I, like the whole setup, everything I showed you, uh, yeah. let me actually count the kit, electronics kit was about 55 bucks. Soldering iron was 60 bucks, so 110 there. Uh, the digital clock kit was like 10 bucks, so 120, and the multimeter was another 30 bucks. So everything I showed you is 150 bucks. So I think that's a cheap starting point, right? Less than a moon clock would cost you to buy and put together. Yeah. Okay. So I that's true. So I actually, should... I had I had one thing before we before we head okay. out. I wanted to talk about. So like, if you're looking for a good book or starting resource, I really really like this book, and I would really really recommend it. And it has like some really great exercises and stuff. It's called Making Things Move. Ooh. Um, it's a DIY mechanics for inventors, hobbyists, artists, etc. It's written by a woman who taught classes at um, the NYU's ITP program, which is mm -hmm. um, kind of a intro to electronics for mostly art, art focused stuff. Um, it has, I don't know, it's got really great exercises and really, really fun projects and talks you through kind of everything you would want to know to like make, make things move, which is like, um, Ryan talks a lot about music. I think uh, making things move is like kind of another thing you can do with electronics. Cause... That's a good question to end on. So if you had like, a, like I think my broad theme with all my making uh, or mm -hmm. attempts at making so far, uh, there's like a clock or time related theme. So I think I want to yeah. make things that either measure time or sense time or do something in time. So that would be the broad theme of, I think things that interest me. Do you have like a theme like that? I think my theme is like home goods. Um, so like, you know, I wanted like the fancy switch and then I wanted the moon clock was really just a project. I wanted a piece of art that did the thing. So I made it. So I like made the thing that did the, the home good that I wanted. Um, yeah. So All right. So that was our electronics episode. Great. Cool. All right. I'll see, see you, you again next then. time with some topic for F. Bye. Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes.
water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokinscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig, a subscriber only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe.